It is a great pleasure to introduce Paola Antonelli. She is the senior curator and head of research and development at MoMA, which is the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And I'm very pleased to have her in particular because she does something that we're not always very good at, which is we create all kinds of new types of interactive technology. And what Paula does is figure out how to take that and translate it into a form that the general public can understand. So I urge you to join me in welcoming Paula Antonelli. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Uh, I cannot believe that it is Wendy's 31st, Kai. It is actually my second, I think, and uh, I'm really, really happy to be here because you're my peeps, as my husband says. Um, I've been at the Museum of Modern Art for 19 years, and I have a background in architecture, but I have a background in architecture from Italy, which means that there were so many students that we never really got to do any drawing. We just learned this methodology, lots of theory. And then we decided to apply our theory, you know, from architecture school in Milan, People graduate, few of them, and then become pizza makers, fashion designers, I mean anything, just a very small fraction become architects. But that kind of upbringing has given me the wherewithal to go beyond cute chairs and fast cars, because that's what people think design still is. And instead, design is applied to so many different um, attitudes and to so many different topics when it comes to uh, a place like the Museum of Modern Art. That's why I would like to talk with you about the history of interaction design at MoMA, which is a relatively recent history, but nonetheless a very tumultuous and intense one. So we have started acquiring you know, in interaction design for, you know, we started acquiring it for about, you know, I would say eight, nine years ago. And this is a piece that we have not acquired, but in my opinion, really condenses what interaction design is about. It's by Revital Cohen, who's um, a designer from London. She's Israeli. She went to the Royal College of Arts. And it, it's called Me Against the Machine. It's software that enables you to scratch your computer and make it bleed when it crashes too much and it gets on your nerves. So this is what I try to explain to people, to the audiences of MoMA. And you know, at MoMA you have people that come to see design, but very small section, very small fraction of them. They usually come to see Matisse and Picasso to take the vitamins of Matisse and Picasso prescribed by the doctor. But then they come to the architecture and design galleries and they tend to stay there for hours because they encounter this sort of objects, which I use to explain the intensity of interaction design. Don't think that interaction design is the only type of design having this kind of communication problem. There are many others, and that's why it's important to be loud. And you know, I, it's an homage to Paris to be showing Talking Carl, which actually was the mascot, you know, it's by Jan Le Corollaire, and it was the mascot of an exhibition that was devoted to interaction design called Talk to Me that happened in 2011. This is like uh, one of the entrances to the show. And I would like to talk a little bit about that exhibition today so as to give you an example of communicating interaction design. But before then, I would like to give you a little sense of the history of interaction design at the Museum of Modern Art uh, willy-nilly, you know, without even knowing that it was interaction design. You're seeing here um, John Giorno, a poet and artist from the 1960s and 1970s. He's on your left-hand side. And he's talking with Allen Ginsberg, and I can't remember who the third person is, but John Giorno is the one that invented, in a way, the 900 number, you know, the number that you dial to get a service and then you pay through your phone bill. It, he did something called Dial a Poem in the late 1960s. You could call a number to get a special poem read to you. So that was already interaction design. When I started at MoMA, I began by trying to figure out how to acquire such objects as Mosaic and all of the and Netscape and all the early interfaces, and I'm still working on that. I would like to acquire some of the work of the students of Muriel Cooper at the MIT Media Lab. You're seeing here some of the work of David Smalls. But I started already acquiring some interaction design and some visualization design. I consider visualization and interaction, when they're good, really close uh, relatives, and that has given me an opportunity 
opportunity to actually attempt to try, to try my way. You see on the left-hand side work by Martin Wattenberg that is called Thinking Machine. It shows how a computer thinks when it plays chess against itself. In the middle, the Newton virus. It's a virus that creates gravity in your computer. So when you insert it and then you turn your computer, all of your icons fall to the bottom. And then, of course, the sugar interface for the one laptop per child that did not survive against uh, Microsoft XP, but nonetheless was a wonderful attempt to create a new way for children to come together in a community. And the first acquisition of interaction design was the reactive books by John Maida that are shown here in an installation in the architecture and design galleries, which gave me really an opportunity to test the way. On the left-hand side, you also see I Want You to Want Me by Seth Kamvar and Jonathan Harris that was done in particular for an exhibition at MoMA. So Talk to Me was, uh, like Design and the Elastic Mind, an opportunity to acquire objects. You know, you see here the scary monsters that were installed at MoMA, first in Design and the Elastic Mind, and then also in the galleries more recently, and more example of the reactive books. But Design and the Elastic Mind that you see here was one of the first opportunities for us to acquire interaction design. It's an exhibition that happened in 2008, and there were commissions about interactivity that were specific for the exhibition. You see on the right-hand side, New City, which was uh, the brief to the designers was to create a new platform better than Second Life, more democratic because everybody could go anywhere, but less democratic in that not anybody could build things. There was a design committee that approved of the stylistic and uh, interactive side of things. You know, it's kind of a dictatorship of aesthetics. It didn't really go through because it was still too expensive, but it was an attempt. And this is Talk to Me, a scene from the show, that um, really let people interact with design you know, and uh, to really have a sense of what interactivity was. In the exhibition was also one of, me, one of my favorite examples of interaction design, which I use all the time to explain to people what interaction design is, which is the MetroCard machine, the vending machine for the subway tickets in New York. It's one of the good examples of interactivity that I can show every New Yorker. And uh, you know you could buy special metro cards with the uh, the graphics for the exhibition. And instead, to show them bad examples of interaction design, I talked about bank ATM machines pretty much everywhere. That always works. The exhibition talk to me explained interactivity by going analog sometimes. I think it's very important if we want to communicate with the public to be able to pick examples from the past and examples that are non-technological because we're still talking to a divided audience. Some people are technologically native. They were either born or brought up in a community and a society that is very at ease with technology, but some others are not. So when you show them objects like Casey Kinzer's between bots, they really immediately understand. Twin bots was an experiment by the student from NYU ITP, little robot made of cardboard, just drawn head and the drawn mouth and two eyes and a little flag, you know, like little engine to make it go, you know, to make it keep going, and a little flag saying, please help me cross Washington Square. That's it. And so Casey would put the robot at the beginning of Washington Square, one side, and then she would hide a camera, a video camera in her back and look at people interacting with the robot. And people were going crazy helping the little thing cross Washington Square. Because you know, New Yorkers, when they see a helpless foreigner trying to go somewhere, immediately lose it. You know? So they were putting it on the side, saying, don't go that way because there are the cars. They were talking to it. You know, dogs were trying to understand what was going on. It was immediately, you just need a mouth and two eyes and people will go for it. I don't have to tell you about uncanny valleys and so on and so forth. Other examples that really work are this dowsing rod that looks for Wi-Fi instead of looking for water, or a beautiful visualization of near field, you know, uh, interactivity that is by Berg that shows what actually goes on, the ghost in the machine. Also, the Attenbar Design Group the Attenbar Design Group is a fictional research group that was created by a student of the RCA that explores what happens when objects are endowed with animal instincts. And it really works to explain, because you know you have a, a CPU of a computer that raises itself on, on its legs if you spill coffee on the desk. 
and then you have a radio that sneezes it. It has, it has WMF, it has VHF, and then it has SNZ, which is sneeze, the sneeze function to free itself of dust. People really get and respond to this. Another section of the show was called I'm Talking to You, and it was about people interacting, about bodies, about the way we present ourselves in the world. I don't have to explain to this audience the iWriter project, but once again, that is a, an amazing example that really works with the wide audience to explain not only interactivity, not only being able to tag a building in downtown LA from a hospital bed using your eyeballs. It also works when you try to explain open source and the power of open source. You know? So it really is an immediate way to communicate. Less understandable immediately, but then very powerful, is this example, Revital, again, the same designer that did the Me Against the Machine, the scratching the computer software. Revital works a lot with scientists. In this particular instance, she's working with a biologist, a neurobiologist, that is uh, studying the ghost limb syndrome. Ghost limb syndrome, as you know, is usually cured by physiotherapy, and by trying to make the symptoms go away using mirrors. You know, so it's, people try, doctors try to erase the sense of the ghost limb. Some neurobiologists think that instead, this ghost feeling should be harnessed because it could help regrow nerve terminations and possibly let new kinds of prosthesis adhere better. Now, scientists love to work with designers because they are kind of freed of the peer review pressure. They can take you know, new margins of freedom, they can experiment. Of course, then they can reinsert the kind of ideas, the broader ideas that they had teaming up with designers into their research. So it's a wonderful way to communicate. And you can see here also another example. Sometimes it's also tongue in cheek, even though it is scientifically serious. This is e chromi, which is a, a synthetic biology project done by some students of Cambridge University in the UK, together with two designers, Daisy Ginsburg and James King. James and Daisy had the idea of uh, trying to work on people's gastrointestinal system. So the students took E. coli, which as you know, our, our, our biggest dwellers, you know, they should pay rent, and they re-engineered them so that they could change color in our guts dep depending on certain pathologies, so it reacting to certain enzymes. So you can imagine, milkshake of E. chromi, do 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 and then your stool is the diagnostic tool, which is quite amazing. In the exhibition, it was presented with these beautiful models, Japanese food models, you know. So it was quite great to see also this particular way of interacting. Another example of interaction with the world is the work of Adi Marom, which is this like platform shoes that could be commanded by an app in your iPhone that raise you up and down. Adi is very petite. So it's a way to reach upper shelves in the supermarket and to talk to threatening tall people. <laughs> Michael Longford and Company's Tentacles was one of the interactive games that were displayed at MoMA. Tentacles is beautiful. It's just about, you know, you're a squid and you're eating other plankton, whatever. It doesn't really matter. You're part of this kind of sea creature world and you're floating around. And that's one of the greatest ways to explain to people interactivities by letting them know that through interactivity they can inhabit worlds that they've never seen before. Life interactive. I'm showing you all the most effective ways of communicating interaction and visualization. This is pure visualization. It's Nicholas Felton's Feltron reports that are basically quantifications. It's the quantified self um, translated into really, really good graphic design. So for many years, Nicholas took all sorts of data about his own life, where he drank, what he, what he ate, when he had sex, when he was bored, and then every year with a different graphic style he would prepare an annual report of himself adding an R to his last name to make it sound more corporate, Feltron. And uh, now he's gone to work to, at Google like so many other people. I want, I want Google to hire me too. I would like to see, you know, and be pampered and do research there. Um, and, you know, Jason Rohrer's passage was uh, an example of a video game. Sometimes an uh, interaction designer, I know, look at gamers in an interesting way. It's another very close relative. It's a love-hate relationship, and we'll see why afterwards. But passage is really great. It's a five-minute game in which you go through your life. 
you don't have a second life. You start and you end, and you go from being born to the little grave. You see the tombstone there. You have choices to make. You can choose to have a partner or not. If you have a partner, life is longer but more complicated, more obstacles. If you don't have a partner, great, very easy, but it ends a little earlier. So you make choices. Completely analog and still a great way to show the quantified non-self in this case, but somebody else is this beautiful book by Christian Meindertzma and Julie Joliet, Pig 05049. They picked a pig in an industrial farm in the Netherlands and they followed the pig after the slaughter in all the different products that the pig ended up with. And it's an amazing, you know, it's more than 180 products ranging from ceramic glaze to cigarette filters because the hemoglobin of the pig is the, in the filters. And it shows you so much, you know, it's so telling of the life cycle of an animal, of course, but also it's, a, it's an x-ray of industries throughout the world. You can also read it as an, the impossibility of keeping kosher or halal. There's pig everywhere. I mean, it's just an amazingly stunning uh, piece of work, and it's poetic and beautiful at the same time, which is also what MoMA looks for. Let's remember where a museum of art, aesthetics and elegance, formal elegance, are important. They mean a lot. We take aesthetics and beauty as a, a social, civil right, a form of respect and a form of communication. So it really is important. You see here also communication with God. I really always look for examples of advanced technology that enhance the most ancient and most important seated human rituals. And in this case, you see on the left-hand side a really beautiful altar-like object that is used by some cloistered nuns in a convent in northern England. They're cloistered nuns, so they only get back Vatican newspapers, which, as you know, they are not very reliable. So they have this like ticker tape in their corridor that gives them news from the BBC. So they always know what to pray about. They have topics to pray about. And they say that this little object, which they call, I think they call it Daisy, I can't remember anymore, but um, it helps them keep their prayers pertinent. On the right-hand side, you see a Muslim prayer mat that has a compass module and an electroluminescent lower layer. And so it lights up when it's in the right direction with Mecca. Now, of course, we all know where Mecca is, but it is the symbolic gesture of technology bowing to religion that I really like and that I think is extremely important. Cities speak to us through technology and through interaction, sometimes in a very literal way. This is Electronic Inc. in Philadelphia. It's a company that does these sorts of emergency response consolidating websites and interfaces. You know that after 9-11, this became a really important focus for our research because the, the lack of coordination amongst the different emergency response bodies was one of the most difficult um, uh, you know, admissions of responsibility from the city of New York. So they've been doing this for many different cities right now. You can also go into the facetious when you talk about the city speaking to you. This is a Twitter feed from the Albion Bakery in eastern London. Once upon a time, we used to go clubbing in Italy and then smelling around to find out when the bread was coming out of the ovens in different bakeries. Well, in this case, a Twitter feed tells you. You know, so the croissant coming out of the oven rush. So it's quite nice to also explain that technology can have this kind of impact on your life in the city. Um, once again, analog, very, very low tech. The work, well, it's not low tech in the background, but it is in, in the output. The work of Cicel Tolas, who's a wonderful scent artist and researcher. She uses technology that is normally applied in the perfume industry to capture the scent of live things without killing them. So usually it's gardenia and, you know, like you know, maybe the glands of some animals. And instead she does it for city neighborhoods. So this is a map of Berlin that is done capturing the scent of different areas of Berlin, which is quite powerful. Another way to look at the life of a city using technology are, you know, the locals and tourists, which I'm sure you already know about, that capture Flickr, um, Flickr feeds and show where tourists 
take most pictures and where locals take most pictures in different cities. It gives you almost like a, um, a gestalt and an inhabitant's uh, map of cities. You know where you want to go and you can see where the concentrations are. You know, if you see an intense blue spot, it might be something that tourists don't get to see normally, but that is really quite amazing. I also like to explain to people that in the future we will live in a world that is going to be the mixture of physical, physical and digital even more, and we already do so. And there are some examples that are particularly powerful, like this great examples by Area Code from quite a few years ago. You know, Area Code was a gaming company that was uh, uh, really good at mixing virtual and physical, and now it's been bought by Zynga and it kind of disappeared into Zynga. But at that time, they were doing games like this that I really loved, Crossroads. So you see it's an old Motorola clamshell phone. And you can see the map of the West Village of New York, where you are right now. And you are the two dots. And then there's a little skull, which is Papa Samdi, this kind of New Orleans monster that does not exist in reality physically, it's only on the phone, but you're running for your dear life because Papa Samdi wants to eat you and it doesn't matter whether it exists in real life in the world or not, you are scared and you run. And it's fantastic to see how we just dive into that kind of mixed reality. Uh, you all know it here, but it's a way of explaining to people that it'll happen even more in the future, that worlds will be mixed. Um, I like also to always show objects that uh, deal with children. Deal with children because children have this direct, you know, like pathway from the brain to whatever new reality and put in front of them. This is the work of Chris Wolpkin and Kenichi Okada. It's a series of devices that are meant to make children feel a little bit like animals. So the red, um, the red helmet has uh, a video inside and the two paws have cameras that magnify only 10 times, but that's enough. The reality under your hands, so you can feel a little bit like an ant. Or you have that periscopic yellow thing that makes you feel a little bit like a giraffe. So you give hints of what worlds could be, and the rest is made up by the imagination. Uh, transgenic bestiary is another beautiful form of interaction where you mix together different animals, and a, an alarm rings when you're finding a DNA compatibility, so you can create new, it's another hint of synthetic biology, and you create new beasts, but also you can understand which ones could be mixed, which is great. Also powerful in explaining interaction design is the BBC Dimensions website by Berg in London. It's a website that enables you to take events that have happened elsewhere in the world, like major events, like the floods in, Afghanistan, then you, in Afghanistan, then you enter your zip code and it works for the UK and for the United States. I never tried it for France, but you might want to try. And you can superimpose that event onto your home turf. So all of a sudden you realize that the floods covered almost the tri-state area in the United States and that the Apollo 11 moonwalk was just a walk around the block. So you really have a deeper um, visceral sense of what happened elsewhere. I also like to talk about Josh Ons They Rule, maybe one of the first websites in 2004 that brought shivers down the spine of so many politicians and corporate board members because it connected board members to different parts of the government of the United States and therefore showed possible conflicts of interest and possible collusions. It was so powerful and elegant. I'm always showing the 2004 version because later versions were not as elegant and once again, aesthetics is important. Uh, here in Paris, a few years ago, Paul Virilio ha mounted a great show at the Fondation Cartier that was based on the idea that humanity today is defined by migrations, by big movements of people outside of their traditional homes because of either natural disasters or man-made disasters. And in the theater, in the, in the basement of the Fondation Cartier, uh, Dillers Cofidio Renfro architects, together with Ben Rubin, and uh, I don't remember anymore, oh, I didn't put all the others, there were many other, I apologize, all the other, um, interactive designers and artists had mounted this 
big theater, round theater, in which you had six different movements that showed different visualizations of data about migrations, ranging from remissions, uh, rem remittances, I'm sorry, of money from one country to the other, to real events that unfolded over history. Quite powerful and politically very dense. Less dense politically, but very poetic, is the incision, the moaning, mowing in the lawn in, in Germany of this QR tag that spells hello world. A tag to be read, a QR tag to be read by the gods, a little bit of a reprise of Celtic runas and, uh, uh, and Mayan land art. So really quite beautiful. Now, in every exhibition, there always is a miscellaneous category, which is the category usually that doesn't that has things that don't fit elsewhere, is it the, the outliers, and usually they're the most interesting ones. Talking about interaction design and communication, I really liked Chris Wobkins and Natalie Jeremijenko billboard bat. Um, no, bat billboard. Hmm, billboard bat would have been interesting. It was the idea that um, bats are considered pests, and instead they're really important for the ecosystem, and also for the ecosystem of cities. They eat very uh, noxious insects, they are you know, they're beautiful. If you go to Austin, and I'm sure many of you have been to Austin, people revere the bats that are under their bridge. And instead, elsewhere, they're reveled. The billboard, the, the billboard is a housing for bats, and also it uses the kind of language that some scientists have understood bats use to communicate to be translated in giant messages on the billboard. I don't know if you remember that movie with Steve Martin, LA Stories, where the billboard on the freeway gives him love advice. I always think of that when I look at this. But basically, this billboard lets people in the city know what bats are doing and kind of communicate with the bats, poetic and beautiful. Another form of, uh, of double entendre, low-tech, powerful, is the Rubik's Cube for the blind with uh, spelled out braille descriptions of the colors as opposed to the colors themselves. Equally powerful and poetic is this website about graphic design and typography that is rendered in a book and the hyperlinks are rendered with red threads, making visible the connections and the inner structure of a rather simple website. And most powerful of all, I'm always accused of mansplaining when I show this. Mansplaining, somebody taught me, is explaining to men in an over-emphatic way. I apologize to you guys. But I've always loved so much this object. It was, to me, the form of extreme communication and the best object in talk to me. It's a menstruation machine. It's meant to be worn by men to experience menstruation in a complete way. It has electrodes that go to your lower abdomen and give you cramps. It has a reservoir in the back. You're supposed to draw your blood, put it in, your ba in the back, and then it gets delivered between your legs. So you feel the whole thing. And it's designed by a great designer that is Japanese English. In, uh, in England, she's a designer. In Japan, she's a pop star. And she always creates not only the object, but also the artistic persona, and then a great pop song. And in, this is Takashi's take. Takashi is a guy that wants to feel like a woman for a little bit. And in the song, in the video, he goes around town with a girlfriend, and the girlfriend is singing, it hurts, right? And it's going to hurt even more. And it's just tongue in cheek, but in truth. Menstruation is one of the final frontiers, you know, of communication between men and women. It's a religious taboo. I just thought that it was truly a sense of where humanity is going in breaking barriers, using technology, and using also the symbology of technology. One of the most recent acquisitions in the collection is Martin Wattenberg and Fernanda Viegas' wind map, which I'm sure some of you have seen. It's a beautiful map that takes data from the National Forecast Agency and visualizes them over the territory of the United States as if it were a wheat field that is really combed by the winds. It's very powerful and a way for the audiences to really understand design. But one of our most recent acquisitions is all about interactivity, and it's an acquisition of 14 video games. It's the first time that our museum has acquired production, you know, like design video games. We have acquired, of course, artists' video games, in particular the gorgeous Feng Menbo Long March, Long Great March. I never remember if it's Great March or Long March, but it's basically a big installation of Super Mario that is all about, you know, China, Mao Zedong, and the Great Wall of China. It's really fantastic. But in this case, 
I have decided to acquire the games not as art, but as interaction design. And to do so, we have worked together with Kate Carmody and Paul Galloway, my collaborators. We have worked for a year and a half or more. We have put together a team of experts, you know, to fill in what we don't know, a team of digital conservators, and we have really thought hard of what to acquire. You see here the first 14 of a wish list of 40. Pac-Man, of course, the original Tetris, which is fantastic, original emulated by the original designers, Alexei Pajitnov and others, uh, because, you know, originally it was designed during the Soviet Union in this lab that was for computer interaction for the Soviet Union. So it was a state kind of uh, patrimony <laughs> in a way. And Alexei and his collaborators mimicked it for us and also mimicked the, uh, the kind of bombed of the CRT. It's amazing. It's like because it's all on digital screens and uh, it's done perfectly. Then Eric Chahis, Another World, you know, French champion, one of the greatest video games ever. Um, we have, of course, also missed, you know, to begin with, and will write SimCity 2000, which it's also interesting to see how we decided to acquire the games and what was the game that worked the most for us. This great Vib ribbon in which you choose the music and the game adapts to the music that you choose. Also, I like because this game goes backwards. You don't, you don't get better or die, you get worse if you don't get better, you know, so you devolve from a rabbit into a frog and then a worm. I also thought that that was fantastic. The Sims is another example, and you can imagine what it means to acquire these video games. You know, that's also what I liked about this acquisition. It was also about what to do when you acquire something that is alive. You know, in this case, The Sims is not a live Sims City they're trying to revive, but there are games that really are alive, and in a way, you cannot acquire the game. Of course, you try to get the code if the game is enclosed, and that's always the holy grail, the code, because you can conserve it for a longer time. If you can't get the code, you try to get an emulation. If you cannot get the emulation, then you get to the dongles and the hardware and the cartridges, but that's the least desirable of all situations. Katamari Damachi and EVE Online, for instance. EVE Online is, ooh, alive and thriving. I'm actually coming, believe it or not, from the EVE Online Fan Fest, which happened in Reykjavik. I, I was speaking at it, I was so happy, just two days ago. EVE Online is 40,000 players or more that come together at the same time. It's a universe in continuous evolution. And in that case, what you acquire is the relationship with the company and with the community of players. So uh, Kate and I actually engaged with the EVE Online community when we had to make the acquisition. And for us, they kind of recorded a day in the life of EVE Online. And that's what we're showing at the museum. Most of the games at the museums are interactive, but the ones that are so complex, the MMOGs, like for instance also Dwarf Fortress, uh, cannot really be played. We showed demos that are made in order to explain in the deepest way possible and communicate as much as possible of the interactivity of the game. Uh, Portal can be played quite easily. And the same happens with Flow, a beautiful experiential game. Passage is also part of this first 14, as is Cannonball. Coming soon will be the Magnavox Odyssey suite and you know Atari suite, and we're gonna try also Nintendo. It's interesting because you can see that since we're acquiring a relationship, some relationships are harder than other, others. And you know, Atari and Nintendo are not the easiest companies to date. <laughs> you know, so, and we have also a list of other games coming up, and together with this group of advisors, we came up with a list that is in some cases obvious, and in other cases instead less obvious but really quite amazing. Like, I didn't know anything about Mule and Core War. Um, Mule and Core War are two games that I'll show you about afterwards that are just quite amazing because uh, Core War, for instance, takes advantage of the limitations of the processor in order to create a beautiful graphic design. So once again, you can see here that we're maintaining the kind of criteria that we apply to design, you know, meaningfulness and beauty and elegance also to the video games. And 
the video games, since they are so pure, there's no function, no practical function anymore, present a great opportunity for us curators at MoMA to explain interaction design. When we show people the video games at MoMA, we tell them, here are the criteria that we used. Interaction design is about behaviors. Designers, interaction designers, design behaviors. They prescribe the way we will want to behave, whether we want it or not. Sometimes they will use also haptic tricks, you know, marble madness, I don't know if you remember, but the controller is a big ball that vibrates as you move around this beautiful landscape. So the scenarios, the rules, the stimuli, the incentives, it's a sort of like benign, when it's benign, mind control. And that's one of the reasons why behaving like MoMA design, we also decided to exclude games that present gratuitous violence. We believe that designers, when they decide to become designers, almost take a Hippocratic oath. You know, it's even when designers are dystopian, they push you towards a better world. They make you think deeper about what you're doing right now. So we decided, for instance, not to insert um, games like Grand Theft Auto that, albeit masterpieces, presented as a choice of behaviors that didn't really throw us in the right direction. Is that, oh, okay, wow. <laughs> Come on, now, it's a little too much. Poor, poor Grand Theft Auto. But I was telling you about Core War. Core War to me is so beautiful. You see here, aesthetics is important, and the best designers are the ones that take the limitations of their trade and make them into strengths. And Core War is exactly that. The scratches that the processor presented when the designers were trying, the programmers were trying to push it harder, became obstacles that the little spaceship has to go through. It's fantastic. But every single game that we chose has an elegance, a formal elegance. Now, when I say aesthetics, I never mean prettiness. You know, I believe that punk is as pretty as, you know, anything. And I, I th I'm talking about aesthetic intention, once again, as a form of respect. The way space is used is also extremely important. Interaction design is about architecture, and that's something that I want the audience to understand. It's about behavior, it's about architecture, it's about aesthetics. Video games in their historical sequencing opened new spatial dimensions for, the, for people. And they are one of our most um, used gateways to the new world that we will inhabit in the future. So I want the audiences of MoMA to also look architecturally at these games. And then, of course, time. You know, um, video games are cinematic experiences, and you can acquire them as cinematic experiences. I want to stress MoMA is by no means the first museum to acquire video games. You have, for instance, the Gaîté Lyrique here in Paris that acquires them. The Museum of the Moving Image in New York has also Space War, which I'm very jealous about, because Space War was the first video game, and it's very hard to acquire with its original hardware. But so the cinematic experience in video games also has to be stressed. Um, video games and interaction design are forms of design that evolve, evolve over time. So it's very important for people to understand that. In the exhibition of these video games, we have chosen not to uh, display any kind of paraphernalia from old arcades. You know, we're all used to seeing video games exhibitions that are like repositioned, repurposed arcades. I didn't want any of that. I didn't want any of that nostalgia to come in between the relationship between the player and the interaction design. In 1934, Philip Johnson, one of the curators and founders of the Department of Architecture and Design at MoMA, did a great show called Machine Art, in which he took propeller blades and, you know, ball bearings and coils and all these pieces of machinery, he took them out of the engines and put them on white pedestals against white walls at MoMA as if they were Brancusi sculptures. And by doing so, he created a shock, a distance, a new perspective, a new point of view, and forced people to appreciate these objects for their formal beauty and their functional wonderment. I would like the same to happen with video games. By eliminating all that was atmosphere, I would like people to focus only on the interaction and understand that. And of course, controllers are part of that. But these are not part of that. So I would like not to show much of all the accoutrements, physical accoutrements of video games, even though we're acquiring them for the study collection to support the research on the video games. Code is what I would like. Code and 
also the physical manifestation of code. What you're looking at here is Ben Fry's visualization of the code of Pac-Man, the Stella map, and we have that in the collection. And I would like you all to help me uh, communicate the concept of the beauty of code at some point. You know, it's, it would be really great for us as curators to be able to get to that point of sophistication and be able to communicate it to the masses. It's something that we're getting to. But this is how the games are installed right now. They're part of an exhibition called Applied Design. So the games are shown together with chairs, together with mind detonators, together with lamps, to show and stress that they are one more type of design. And they are shown, as I was mentioning to you here, in a very pure way. You're seeing on the right-hand side the display for EVE Online. We have a wallpaper showing the EVE Online universe besides the gate. You know, and uh, also, and we have this video demo that's created by the audiences. In other cases, games can be played. Katamari Damachi, for instance, can be played, and so can Pac-Man and Tetris. But you see, there are screens that are embedded flush in the wall that are kind of mimicking the size of the original screen, if such a size could be had, and then the controller. Interestingly, the reaction from the gamers was not violent. They approved of it, and I was surprised. But it's an experiment. We try. And uh, in this particular case, we have a reason to do it, and people respect reasoning. What's been really funny is the reaction from a very small portion of the art world. First of all, we're showing these games as examples of interaction design, but people do not even understand the word design. Oh, MoMA wants video games to be art. Personally, design does not eat, need art, I believe. You know, people always think that designers aspire to be artists. Oh no, we aspire to be really great designers, and artists many times aspire to be like us. So, but that kind of hierarchy is still embedded in the world of the arts. And this is Jonathan, what's his name? I can't even remember. Yeah, uh, yeah, Jonathan Jones. <laughs> He's the art critic of The Guardian that came out with this, like, oh my god, video games are not art. And when you ask him why, nobody can answer. They just like throw out Picasso, 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 and you're like, why? So immediately, The Guardian itself responded to, to its art critic saying, what are you talking about? And then completely unprompted, John Maida went on Wired saying, shut up. It is, you know, video games are for MoMA. I said, OK. Um, then we were in the approval matrix in New York Magazine as highbrow and whatever. I mean, we were in the positive side of the matrix. And the best was the New Republic, the new, newly refounded New Republic with Chris Hughes as an editor-in-chief whom I respect tremendously, had this amazingly pretentious long article by this woman that I've never heard of. And I don't know if you can read if you can read the last two lines there, um, it's fascinating debate, but the answer to the above question, which is, are video games art, is bluntly, no. Video games aren't art because they are quite thoroughly something else, code. Oh, yeah? So a Picasso painting is not art because it's oil paint, right? So, I mean, the craziness and the parti pris, the, uh, the kind of um, un uh, unreasonable nature of these claims makes me realize that the world is really split, not in two, but in, you know, 99 and one. The one is these kind of people that do not understand that art or no art, video games are part of our reality. And popular culture, so-called popular culture, is eating up the high culture of yesteryear that is so isolated and so, in many cases, meaningless that does not really count anymore. And, you know, once upon a time, I like to remember in the 1930s, these objects that were part of the exhibition Cubism and Abstract Art were stopped by customs in the United States because they were not considered art. So it's happened before and it will happen even more in the future. To me, what really matters is to be able to have the wherewithal to explain to the world that there are other forms of design, that there are other frontiers to break. This is an acquisition at MoMA that I'm extremely, extremely proud of. It happened a few years ago, and it's the acquisition of the at sign. Now, the at sign is a conceptual acquisition, if you wish, because the at sign is in the public domain, but it's a very ambitious acquisition because it tests our responsibility as curators. I believe that our responsibility is to show the world the best examples of every form of design, and the at sign condenses it all. It was first found in the Middle Ages, 
the monks used it when they were copying manuscripts to fuse the preposition ad in Latin, which meant in relationship with or towards. So it had this relationship meaning already. It survived throughout the centuries, used by merchants to, um, to indicate quantities. Then in the, 19th, in the 1800s by accountants to indicate at the rate of. To make a long story short, when Ray Tomlinson in 1971 was creating the email program, he had to find a way to fuse that long line of code that connected the person to the machine name. And he decided to adopt this key that was already on the keyboard. It was already there. He did some research. He realized it was a preposition. It realized it meant in relationship with. He simply adopted it. So here you have something that's existed for many centuries that gets repurposed for the same use with the technology and the world of today, so beautiful. You know, tradition connected with progress. And that at the same time is also in the public domain, which means we don't need to possess objects in the collection anymore. We can just indicate them. What I try to tell people is that it's as if a butterfly were flying and cast a shadow on the wall and we kind of captured that shadow. So when people call us at MoMA as they do for other objects and they ask us for a picture of the at sign and the permission to use it, we just tell them, you know what, you know, it's on your keyboard. And they were like, what do you mean? I'm like, yeah, it's on your keyboard. We recommend you use as a font American typewriter because that was the closest font to the monotype that Ray Tomlinson used. But you know, you can use whatever you want, every size you want, no problem. And it's mind boggling to them. But even in this case, it condenses so much of what we're doing right now in the world. We're owning less, we're using things more. Objects are not anymore uh, things to be possessed, but they are means to an end. Usually, they're thresholds, objects, physical objects like iPhones and other devices, they're thresholds into the world that is ours, that is this audience's interaction design. Interaction design is the future. and. It is the future that we need to learn to communicate. So I really exhort you all to take speaking classes, to take writing classes, and to make an effort to explain it to the people. Because the people usually understand it more than you even think. Thank you very much. Now we we have time for questions, and I'm going to take them. Who's going to give me the questions? OK, so I'm going to start. OK, great. So the first question is, is about yourself. Oh. Um, so how did you get from an architecture student to interaction design at MoMA? Well, um, I found out early on that I was a really bad architect. I worked as an architect for six months. I realized that I really sucked at that. And so in typical Italian fashion, I started, you know, working for a magazine, which is what you do. So I was, um, I was at Domus for four years and then at Abitare for another two years. I was doing freelance curation. Then I fell in love with a surfer from Malibu that was the audiovisuals guy at a conference. So I started stalking the poor guy in Malibu and then I got a teaching job at UCLA. And to make a long story short, I was surfing too. You know, in a way, I caught the right wave. I was lucky. I had my first interview for the MoMA job here in Paris at Les Deux Magots which is quite funny because the curator was here. And I've uh, been there for 19 years, so it was yeah. really fortuitous, but also um, a good gift from my very chaotic education in Italy. <laughs> All right, so I got the second question for you. Um, so some of the works you presented were by designers, some of them were artists. Um, What's your take on the difference between the two and the potential synergy? Difference between design and art. I find it quite... Um, quite moot. I don't really think about it too much. Uh, it's not anymore in the output or in the technique or in the medium. It's basically a declaration of intention. If somebody comes to me and says, I'm an artist, okay. If somebody comes to me and says, you're a designer, then the scrutiny is design. So I change the way I look at something when somebody tells me that it's design. I immediately look for the positive outlook, even when it's dystopian. You know, some of my favorite designers, like, you know, Sputniko, the menstruation machine woman, uh, come from the RCA Design Interactions uh, program at the, you know, in London. And some of the work they do is really dark and really dystopian, but they do it because they consider it their job to build scenarios for the future 
that project the consequences of our choices of today. So it's always going in that direction. So if you tell me you're a designer, I'm going to check out that. I'm going to check out some sort of function that can be emotional. I'm going to check out the way you communicate. I'm going to check out the uh, formal output. And I'm also um, going to check out the price and where you, where you live. Like um, one of the biggest problems in the past decade and a half has been the incursion of art galleries in the design world, trying to drive prices up and to position design as you know, like little snacks for bored art collectors at art fairs. So that's something that I'm very wary of in the relationship between art and design. Otherwise, it doesn't concern me or worry or bother me at all. Yeah, this is a question about the, the diversity of, of design and, and where it comes from. Do you see a shift uh, from uh, uh, centers of innovation uh, shifting to uh, developing countries? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's, it's very beautiful. Um, lately, there's many ways to call it. You know, the Indians call it Jugad information. It's this, uh, in, uh, sorry, Jugad innovation. It's this idea of uh, frugality as a way to deal with things. And it's funny because so many of our countries, including France and Italy, are countries where once upon a time we were not throwing away any part of the animal. You know, we were recycling and using everything, and we still do because it's part of our culture. But m more and more, um, so-called developed countries, I really don't like any term to describe the disparities in the world, but so-called developed countries are looking to developing countries in order to learn how to behave when it's in terms of sustainability and in terms of recycling and just sensibility and holistic approach. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, the geography of design, as you said, has changed and the centers of innovation are not anymore where the physical plants are as it used to be once upon a time when you had industries that made things. It's not anymore where the fairs are. I think that the geography of design today is defined by schools more than anything else. So I like to see certain poles where things happen. The RCA is one, Eindhoven is another for a certain type of design. For other types of design instead, Media Lab still tries and then you know it's also moved to Korea. It's really, it's interesting. I look at schools a lot. So, how come you're exhibiting games that people cannot experience? Oh, they can experience them. Um, they can experience, experience most of them. I am not showing the games, I mean, I'm not letting them experience the games that take way too long to master, but they can do it at home. You know, you can play Dwarf Fortress, you can see the demo there, and then you can go home. And if you have the brains and the time and the strength, you can play Dwarf Fortress. But everything, I also don't want people to play The Sims, because otherwise you would have the same person at MoMA in front of the screen for two hours. And we have, we have you know, three million visitors a year. So um, they can play Tetris, they can play Pac-Man, Katamari Damachi, Myst, Another World. Um, they can play Flow, Portal, you know, they can play many. It's only the few long-term ones that they cannot play. So I've got, a, I've got a really hard one here. You talked about incremental designs and game changers. Mm -hmm. um, what's your actionable advice? How, how, how does one make a game changer? What's the, what is the key ingredient? I don't think that you go about making a game change. I think you do your work as best as you can and, and it might become a game changer. I just don't believe in having this kind of, you know, I want to change the world. You know, just start working and then we'll see. <laughs> the last two questions. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so the first one is, um, so it, in a number of games you're exhibiting, there's violence. And violence. so how, what's your take on, on the violence that people experience in playing games at home versus the one you exhibit in your collection? It's so <clears throat> difficult to put your finger on it. Uh, interestingly enough, I'm working on a separate project right now that's called Temporary Title, but it's called A History of Violence. And that's about design and violence because um, there's um, a, a text that is the Bible for many designers, like physical designers, that's Victor Papanex design for the real world. And it starts out with declaration, I don't remember the exact quote, but it's, it goes like this, that there are many, there are some professions that are more dangerous that, than design, but only few. So design can be very dangerous, um, even though it might look like it's benign. One of the classical examples is the car and the whole Ralph Nader campaign in the 1960s for the safety belts. So I'm doing a whole project that is about design and violence. 
When it comes to video games and violence, I've been talking so much. I was talking the, just a few days ago with, with Bran Farron. Bran Farron used to be one of the head at Disney Imagineering, and he was a part of the committee behind the video games exhibition at the Smithsonian. And we were talking about the fact that there's no denying, um, there's a certain anesthesia that happens when you're exposed to violence continuously. But I think that when people come to MoMA, they should know what they get. They can get a lot of violence, they can get a lot of guns and a lot of depiction of violence in the painting and sculpture galleries. When they come to the design galleries, you know, when I started at MoMA 19, 19 years ago, one of the first proposals of acquisitions that I did was a Beretta gun. And I was told at that time, we don't um, acquire guns and weapons, and I asked why. And they told me, in design, what you see is what you get, right? So it's funny, but of course there's always reading between the lines, but less in design than in art. So you need to have a certain directness of purpose when you show design objects. And that's why we decided not to show gratuitously violent game, even though we have Street Fighter 2 in the wish list. Street Fighter 2, yeah, martial arts. And uh, Grand Theft Auto, no. <laughs> I, I, I saved the most important question for last. Mm -hmm. It says, I think I have good interactive art stuff. Yeah, we have I what? I'm sorry? We have I think I have good interactive art stuff. Uh -huh. How can I let MoMA present it? Um, <laughs> It depends. Uh, if it's really good, hmm, you can send it to us via email. You know, to MoMA, there's a general information. It'll get to me. And if it's really good, I'll select it. Let, let me, I'm sorry, let me yeah. add to this. Um, it doesn't say so, but it's, you're here at the conference. Can I talk to you after the show? It doesn't say that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Right. no, it's, it's going to be a little complicated, but if you catch me, sure. All right. Thank, <laughs> Thank you so you. much. So